Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. And a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for making the work we do here on YouTube possible. More on that at the end of the episode, but for today, we are diving in and we are going to tier rank every cantrip in Dungeons & Dragons 5e. This is part one of our three-part video because there are 46 cantrips in uh, Dungeons & Dragons, so we're gonna do the first third of them today. Now, as usual with all of our tier ranking videos, these are just our opinions and what we think these cantrips have to offer. When we rank them, we want to keep in mind that most cantrips have a place at the table with the right character or the right player if it brings to life the fantasy that you want to see with your character in your game. However, we like to look at the mechanics, the gritty details, and decide which of these cantrips you should always be looking at taking and which you may want to avoid. Up on the screen right now, you're going to see a brief summary of the metrics we use to rank these cantrips. In brief, an S-tier cantrip is one that we think characters of any class who can take that cantrip should take it, and other characters might even want to take Magic Initiate for it because it does great damage or does something that is really unique, really powerful, and can't be readily replicated with mundane weapons, equipment, and other mundane actions. A-tier is a strong choice for any character who has the option of taking it. It's going to perform really well in either utility or damage dealing, and it offers an option that you might be able to do with mundane equipment or skills, but the cantrip's going to perform it better. As always, B stands for build. It means that a B-tier cantrip is potentially really good, but it depends on the character's build options and other things that they select for that character. Or it just might be middle of the road. So in many cases, if your response to, well, this cantrip is really good, but just for this character, then it probably means it's a B tier. C tier cantrips are situationally useful. This doesn't mean that they're bad. If they're in the right moment, in the right campaign, on the right character, they could perform really, really well. But generally speaking, they are limited to niche applications. And a D tier cantrip is one where it's damage or utility is not better than what characters can just do with mundane weapons and equipment and skills. It's pretty much useless, except maybe in the most remote situation, or there's another cantrip which is just flat out better than it in virtually all situations. So we're gonna take this all in alphabetical order, kicking things off with the letter A, and that is Acid Splash. This is a conjuration cantrip that does basic acid damage to a range of 60 feet, does 1d6 acid damage on a failed dexterity saving throw, and it's unique because it can potentially hit two targets. It should be noted that in order to hit two targets, they do need to be standing directly next to each other, so it doesn't apply in all situations. For that reason, I do think that this is a C tier cantrip. I think it's a B tier cantrip. Despite the fact that nobody takes it, 1d6 damage is not terrible. For me, the C tier comes in because it does lower damage than a lot of the other damage dealing cantrips. Yes, you can hit two targets with it, but that is going to be in niche situations. For me, I just feel like in terms of damage dealing cantrips, I would pick a lot of other options before I would even look at Acid Splash, and that includes options that I'm going to be giving B tier to as well. Acid is a pretty rarely resisted damage type. 1d6 damage is respectable. Many monsters do not have good dexterity saving throws, but the ones that have good ones are usually really good. I think Acid Splash is kind of underrated overall, hmm. um, so I'm going to stick with the B tier. All right. Next up, we have Blade Ward. Uh, Blade Ward allows you to use an action to gain resistance to piercing, slashing, and bludgeoning damage on yourself. That sounds useful, but again, this is a cantrip that I don't see really anybody take, and it's really hard to justify spending your entire action to gain half damage. There's a lot of abilities and, and other options out there to gain resistances that can come into play and spending your action to do so in the midst of combat is tough. I'm kind of on the fence between C or D tier on Blade Ward. This is a challenging one because 
Barbarians entering into a rage as a bonus action for a minute and having half damage from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing weapons is amazing. But as soon as you have to spend an action every turn to get it, it's no longer good because you can't do anything else. In a situation where the character knows that they're going to get beat up very, very badly and wants to try to survive, it could be potentially good. But it's very hard to justify that. And for characters, it's one of those cantrips that, like, I've seen people try to build a character around Blade Ward to optimize that damage resistance. But it it is almost always ends up being a very long and convoluted way to avoid taking a level of Barbarian. Uh, So I think it's C tier for me. Yeah, I I put it as a low C. um... Not my first choice, not even my second, third, or fourth choice. Rarely would I take this yeah. on a character. It's a really unique effect, and it's surprise. Like if if it was a bonus action, it would be like S tier. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's amazing how just the the action type changes how good good it is, and it's one of those things where like if you could cast it as a bonus action as a sorcerer through quicken spell. Okay, but now you have to spend your sorcery points for that, and it gets really expensive at that point. Well, they say that the best defense is a good offense, mm-hmm. and and I mean, like, if I could spend my action casting Fireball and killing 20 minions, then I'm not going to take a yeah. lot of damage. If, if I could use my action, even if I don't have Fireball, because this is a cantrip, so comparing those isn't fair, but if I could cast Eldritch Blast or even have, like, a melee attack or anything that could kill a target then guess what? I'm not taking any damage from it. One of the other things that's worth noting is that mathematically, the dodge action, which gives enemies disadvantage on attack rolls against you, depending on your character's AC and the circumstances, could mathematically result in your character taking less damage. Or taking... Because, again, Blade Ward only applies to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from weapon attacks. The dodge action gives your character causes attacks against you to have disadvantage. So that's where Blade Ward kind of also runs into this money thing where where it's like you're giving up your action, you're giving up a cantrip known, and you might not actually come out that much further ahead than just dodging. Next up we have Booming Blade. This oh, yeah. is a little bit more of a complicated cantrip. Uh, it affects your melee weapons. So when you cast Booming Blade, you get to make a melee attack against a creature within five feet of you. Once you reach a certain level, this attack is just going to do extra damage automatically. But no matter what, if that target decides to move, then they are going to take a bunch of damage. This is a favorite of Eldritch Knights and really uh, any sort of melee combatant sort of spellcaster character. I think that this was an S tier cantrip that is now an A tier cantrip because Hmm. they put in the stipulation that previously there was all of these ways that you could kind of finagle this to do a lot for you but they did add the stipulation that it has to be an actual weapon that it costs a certain amount of money yeah so you can't use it on like a summoned weapon there was a lot of play going on there um and i think that that was an appropriate dial back because this was s tier and as we know a tier is kind of the sweet spot i think that this still lands in the sweet spot of excellent cantrips though this is an excellent cantrip for the right character. Okay. I think the Booming Blade is actually the definition of a cantrip that becomes S tier for the right character build. Yeah. Because I don't think that your typical wizard, sorcerer, or warlock is necessarily going to want to take this spell. But I do think your Eldritch Knights, your Arcane Tricksters, your Blade Singers, and your Hex Blades absolutely love this spell. As well as like your paladin sorcerer builds and stuff like that. But I don't think that your conventional wizard really cares about this spell. You raise a good point, and that actually more so brings up a question about our ranking system, which is if we look at a spell that is dedicated to melee combat, if we look at the grand scheme of everybody who has access to this cantrip, yeah, if you don't do melee combat, then it's not for you. If we look at characters who this cantrip works for then it's a much higher ranking 
Indeed. And I think that that's why we have the ranking of B for the build. Yeah. Right? This is unequivocally for Hexblades, Eldritch Knights, Bladesingers, Arcane Tricksters, S tier. But for everyone else, it's, it's a D. B. It might be. It might be D. And that I, makes it a B, I think. I don't know if it would be D tier for everyone else. I think it might actually still be pretty. Like, for everyone else, it's actually still better than making a weapon attack. If I'm a wizard, though, and I have the choice of casting Booming Blade on my dagger mm -hmm. or casting Firebolt. Firebolt's better, right? So I, th I think B overall. Yes, yeah. I, yeah. I'll agree with that. Yeah. Coming up next is Chill Touch. This necromancy cantrip does 1d8 necrotic damage, but it has some really unique riders that I think make it a little underrated. The first thing is that it requires an attack roll, not a saving throw. And I just want to say that for metrics going forward, cantrips that work on attack rolls are almost always better than cantrips that work on saving throws. The reason for this is that at higher levels of play, monsters saving throws scale better than their, attack, than their armor class. So if you look at most high level monsters, they're gonna succeed their saving throws but you're going to be able to hit them more often with the way that the scaling works. So that it's an attack roll, great. Necrotic damage is actually surprisingly rarely resisted. But then, the spell prevents healing. And if you hit an undead with it, that undead has disadvantage on attack rolls against you. I think that Chill Touch is the unassuming S tier of damage dealing cantrips. You're going to go as far as S tier with Chill Touch. Listen. It does pretty good damage. It hmm. does rarely resisted damage. Mm -hmm. If you're fighting a troll, you have that fight at bay. Anything that regenerates. There's a lot more creatures than just trolls. Trolls is the yeah. typical answer. Yeah. Anything that regenerates, any time that there is like an enemy healer or an enemy that would heal, if you're chill touching them, game over. If mm. you're fighting undead, this is the best cantrip to have in your arsenal. Mind you, there are some undead that are immune or resistant to necrotic damage. But just because they're immune or resistant to necrotic damage doesn't negate the yes. disadvantage or the stopping their healing. And that's the interesting thing. Hypothetically, you could chill touch an undead creature that had regeneration that was immune to necrotic damage. I actually don't know if there is an undead creature that is resistant or immune to necrotic damage that has regeneration. I mean, if there is, this still works it to still shut works them on down. Them. Yeah, yeah, it does. So I think that in the grand scheme of things, Chill Touch yeah. does not get the credit it deserves. Actually really good against vampires. Yeah. Surprisingly good against vampires. Chill Touch is your vampire, yeah. troll, undead, thwarting cantrip that just works. And yeah. when you're not fighting those... It still does good damage. I think, for me, it is it is borderline S tier for me in that underrated way. But I think being more realistic, I'm going to give it an A. I'm not realistic. I, I think <laughs> okay. Chill Touch is underrated. People should be taking it more. Next up, we have Control Flames. There's kind of a suite of cantrips that were added that control all the elements in different mm. ways. This is the first of those with the control over fire. This spell allows you to take a flame that exists and either extend it, extinguish it, brighten it, or make fun shapes with it. Pretty cool. Yeah, if you like spreading fire. Who but doesn't? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, let's, let's face it, there's a lot of ways to spread fire, and fire likes to spread on its own as well. Um, you can have a variety of these, these effects. Honestly, I think this is D tier for me. I just think it's, it, like... You can get this effect from Control Flames, like a character with Prestidigitation and Firebolt is almost there. Yeah, and those are two cantrips that I think have a lot more applications. Yeah. I, I will say that these control cantrips, there's there's fire, wind, water, and earth. Um, I actually think that the fire is the weakest of the options. The other ones yeah. have lots of useful applications. We'll talk about them when we get to them. But I think out of the suite of options here, the, the fire control... I have Firebolt and Prestidigitation and even like something like Thaumaturgy, like you already have cantrips that can kind of brighten flames or change their colors or have these like interesting effects where this cantrip doesn't really specify you're going to be damaging anybody with it. 
In terms of solving problems, I can't see myself solving a lot of problems by brightening a light, extinguishing a light. If I'm a Gloomstalker Ranger and I had this maybe to ex- there there might be some yeah. plays where in on certain very specific characters extinguishing a flame in a room is great i could see like the extinguishing the fire thing is this is kind of where this cantrip is like a weird sil- silver bullet for that scenario where you're like you're in a burning building and you have to put out a fire here here's here's the thing Big X-Men fan. And I remember when I was getting into X-Men and my favorite character was Pyro. And then I remember realizing that the character of Pyro couldn't create his own flame. He always carried a lighter with him and then he could control it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's lame. You can't even make fire? <laughs> yeah. What kind of an X-Men are you? Yeah. And like, that's, I feel like that's this cantrip. It's like, you can't even make fire. Like, yeah. you just, you just get to be like, I moved that fire. It's bigger now. And people are like, okay. And it's got to be a non-magical flame. So you can't even like use this to like get clever with wall of fire or something. So yeah. Eh. Yeah. Now, now we're not quite done playing with fire yet because one thing that control flames can't do is make fire. So now we can create a bonfire instead. (laughs) Create bonfire is a fun little cantrip. You get to create a bonfire as the name implies. This is an interesting cantrip because it requires concentration. And when you create the fire, you can create it in the space of an enemy. Creatures who move into the space of the bonfire or end their turn there do have to make a dexterity saving throw, taking 1d8 damage, which levels up as as you do. Um, It's interesting because this has some utility applications. Yes, it does, and it has weird battlefield control applications because we've talked about so many times how much we love spells like Wall of Fire that you can kick people into. Create Bonfire at higher levels is like an at-will tiny Wall of Fire that you can kick people into. And so, in theory, a character could get reasonable damage by using Create Bonfire and another spell that pushes or pulls other creatures like Eldritch Blast with with Forceful Blast or Thorn Whip to pull enemies into it. It's a cool low-level combo. Yeah, and I think like even outside of that, if you are playing in a survival style campaign mm. where you have to forage and camp and make sure you have resources, Having a bonfire at will uh, can save your life. Uh, That's a little bit of a niche, but Mm -hmm. this spell offers that. Yeah, but I mean, in that case, you'd want to make a bonfire that lasts all night, and this spell only lasts one minute for concentration on it. That minute's enough to cook a hot dog. Is it? Yeah, I think you can. Yeah, I think so. You can cook a hot dog in a minute in a roaring fire. Yeah, reasonable. Reasonable. Reasonable reasonable use of the spell. I will rule that. All right, so... This is the hot dog cooking spell, S tier. No, I'm. I'm. Um, I think this is probably. I think it's B tier, dude. I mean, I was think I was leaning C, but. I, I think you could build a character. You could build a druid that has create bonfire and thorn whip. That's true. And has like a cool shtick. Is that good? Maybe not. But but I feel like there's some there's there's enough here that you could work with something. Moving on from fire, but staying with the theme of lighting areas, we have dancing lights. This allows you to create a bunch of luminous orbs that you can move around and have them dance in the air above you. They can actually form shapes. You can actually make them into a vaguely humanoid form of like medium height and whatnot, uh, which is really interesting uh, use of this spell. So not only can you light a hallway, but you can confuse your enemies with glowing people. I gotta be totally honest, I think this is a D tier spell. It requires concentration. It does give you like these weird lights that you can control. And so there's this weird situation where like maybe it's better than light when you need to illuminate some like you need to move the lights far away from you, right? But I always just cast light on like my staff or whatever, and yeah. then it's moving with me. That's that's yeah. kind of the difference. Or I've even cast light on a rock and then like thrown it. Yeah, and it has a limit of a hundred and twenty foot range, so you you can't move them so far ahead 
that it like a lot of creatures now have 120 foot or 300 foot dark vision like it it really doesn't do that for you i it's 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 not better than lighting a torch it's not better than like it's not it's barely better than lighting a torch and it requ- and it requires concentration also what do you do with a glowing figure uh, i mean there's probably a lot but i feel like creating an illusion of a creature is always going to be better than a glowing amorphous blob in the uh, woods or I, something. I, I mean, maybe they think it's yeah. an. Uh, I'm being abducted by aliens. There's a glowing amorphous blob coming towards Let, me. Let's face but... it. We gotta really dig. We really gotta dig to find a, a, like where this is actually better than any other cantrip. Uh, no, it's D tier. All right. Next up, we have Druid Craft, which is a great spell for druids. It allows you to do all the fun, simple, druidy things that you want to do in your role playing and adventures. Uh, this allows you to determine the weather for the next 24 hours. It allows you to create small sensory effects of leaves blowing or wind or uh, growing flowers or various other druid type stuff. And I gotta say, that although this cantrip doesn't do any damage, the useful applications of it in either role playing or even exploration, knowing the weather is pretty cool. You can create a small fire with this cantrip. So uh, this becomes better than create bonfire. It can't damage creatures. Mm. But if your goal was, oh, we're out camping and we need to create a bonfire, don't take create bonfire. Take Druid Craft, and you can do that and many more things. Oh, bring a match? No. Um, I'm a Druid. I don't bring matches. Of all the Prestidigitation type spells, Druid Craft excites me the least. I'm not really interested in making a skunk smell. Whenever I think of predicting the weather for the next 24 hours, I think of the Druid casting this spell and being like, it's going to rain. And the rest of the party standing there in the rain being like, thanks, we know. I mean, yeah, there is the case where he's like, a storm's coming and the ranger's like yeah there's clouds heading this way we can all yeah. see it uh so <laughs> i i get that i don't think this is d tier because i do think that there are a lot of useful applications for it and if i was a druid i'd probably take it i think if i was a druid that didn't have extra cantrips i might take it but it's it's a hard choice because druids don't get as many cantrips as other characters do i'm giving it a c i'll i'll okay we can give it a C. Eldritch Blast is an S tier spell. Yep. Do we need to say anything else? I mean, <laughs> there is a case to be made that it's B tier because it's only useful in the right build, which is Warlocks. Although, is no, it? I, no, I don't think that's okay. Warlocks get a lot by taking Agonizing Blast and Fort. Like, it becomes like S tier plus with a Warlock with the right build elements. But if you look at it from, I think, an objective standpoint, it's an attack roll based spell that makes that makes more separate attacks that deals force damage. I think that many other characters would take a feat to get it. I've seen bards, paladins, and sorcerers take magic initiate to get this plus hex. I was trying to play the devil's advocate like you're right. Um it also like it does force damage. Yeah. Uh you can't Resist force damage. Very There's a often. handful of creatures in the game that have resistance or immunity to force damage, so it sucks going up against a helmed horror. Oh no! Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, no, I, I do agree that it is S tier. Uh, I think yeah, if you're a warlock, like take it. Even if you're playing a hexblade, take it. Uh, if you're playing another character, there are reasons why you might consider grabbing Eldritch Blast. People think of multi-classing into Warlock to get Eldritch Blast. Yeah. So that's that's how S tier the spell is, is that it, it it becomes part of the orbit of a whole multi-class build. Like, I'm going to be a Sorcerer Warlock. I'm going to be a Paladin Warlock because I want to take Eldritch Blast. And I mean, it, it doesn't help that the Hexblade exists as well. But like, I think that... A lot of Hexblade should take Eldritch Blast as well, just because it's so good. When you can't get into melee, it's yeah. it's better than having a bow. Yeah. It's it's unequivocally, I think, the best ranged damage dealing cantrip in the game, bar none. 
Next up, we have Encode Thoughts. I'm going to try to summarize here. This spell allows you to take your thoughts, pull them out of your head, and turn them into ribbons. If you are casting a spell on another creature, such as Detect Thoughts, or something that allows you to impact their mind, you can pull their thoughts out and turn them into ribbons. Uh, and then you can give those other those ribbons to other people who can then read those ribbons using this cantrip. This is a weird... It's a weird setting-specific spell from Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. I, I like... I, I It's D tier, but I don't want to say that this is garbage. It's just, like, so absolutely niche. It's it's cool. I am actually pretty sure Dumbledore casts this. It, it, um, I just don't... I just don't... Maybe I don't get it. I, I don't understand. Like, it, it feels like there's a step missing here. This feels like a spell that should have been a first level spell that was a ritual. This feels like something that I would give to an NPC for really nothing more than like loose plot threads. Like yeah. like you find the missing thought. Is is this spell like literally weave plot thought thread? It's a plot uh, thought thread. Yeah. Um D tier for players if you're a yeah. GM uh, you might consider building a story around a missing thought or yeah. something like that. That's cool. I, I, I just don't know what, what it is. If you have like a weird story of how you use the spell and it was like amazing in your campaign, um, I'd love to hear it. As a player. Yeah. And I would love to hear if that happened more than once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Next up, we have Firebolt. Uh, this is kind of the bread and butter damage dealing cantrip. You shoot a bolt of fire. And it does 1d10 damage, and that increases as you level up. Uh, 1d10 is one of the better damages that you can get out of a cantrip. Mm -hmm. Fire is one of the most resisted damage types in the game. So there is a weight there. Um, Firebolt is the go-to for 90% of players who can take it but I think I'm still going to give it a B tier. And this is coming from somebody who has taken it because I love people who set things on fire. It's it's how I play. So, yeah, when I play a sorcerer, I take Firebolt. But really, I think my next character is probably leaning towards Chill Touch, and Firebolt is becoming least, less and less interesting to me as I think about the other cantrips mm. available. I, I think that... It's on this board. It's B plus. Yeah. Um, I think that it's it's kind of like the best damage dealing cantrip you can choose if you can't get Eldritch Blast or don't have something else in mind. Again, it's an attack roll based spell. It has a good range, and it's you're rolling that D ten. It's just that the thing that holds it back is the fact that it is such a commonly resisted damage type. But it can start fires. Yeah. Uh, so it like it's not by any means bad and when i say like yeah b plus is the right ranking here because there's a lot of other cantrips that do really phenomenal things mm -hmm. this kind of is really the basic attack of most blasters yeah, yeah. but it is basic yeah b for basic b for you're basic. basic firebolt you're basic we love you you're good but you're basic Next up, we have friends. Uh, this is we have friends. <laughs> we have may, friends. You may we're not friends. have. We're friends. We don't have any other friends. Joe and Jill are. No, friends. we have friends. Yeah. Okay, we have friends. We have lots yeah. of friends. Anyway, uh, this spell does this spell actually help you make friends though? This spell helps you make enemies. Um, yeah. This the friends cantrip makes enemies because it requires concentration. You charm a creature, and when the spell ends. Uh, that creature knows that they've been charmed and is like, what the heck, you just charmed me. Yeah. <laughs> now, I actually feel like my opinion on this is different than Monty's. Hmm. I know that, Monty, you told me straight up that you don't like this cantrip. Does well, that still... So the thing about friends is that you there's no saving throw mm -hmm. for it, but you have to use it against a creature that isn't already hostile to you. Yeah. And then after the spell's over, they're going to become hostile towards you. Yeah. And you did that in exchange for getting advantage on charisma checks against them. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to get advantage in this game mm -hmm. that then don't turn someone that you're trying to persuade or lie to or influence and make them angry 
I agree, and I'm not going to give this a high ranking, but I actually love putting this cantrip on characters who are designed to be like mischievous, illusion, manipulative characters. It's like we see the trope all the time of like they, they, they like, you know, these are the droids you're looking for. And then when they go away, at some point, those stormtroopers are like, wait a second, those were the droids I'm looking for. But the thing is, is that even if we, if we even say, let's use this spell in the stormtrooper situation. You cast the spell on the stormtrooper. You use it to gain advantage on your deception check. In a minute, that stormtrooper is going to realize that you used magic on them, and now they're hostile towards you. Yeah, but they don't know where I went. I drove in away minute, in my little speed. I'm, it, a, I'm in a speeder car. But, but remember, you had to cast the spell, mm -hmm. and now you have advantage on... Like, you don't get to get a whole minute away. Because you had to spend some of that duration making the skill check and conversing with them to, to actually take advantage of the advantage that you got. I'm not saying it's a good cantrip. I'm just saying it's a fun cantrip for certain characters. I think it's total D tier. Never use this cantrip. Use it if it sounds really fun to mess with people and make enemies. It's just... If, if you want to make enemies, it's as Yes, making enemies S tier. <laughs> I like to stir the pot. I like the idea of like I walk I walk up to the guard, I'm like, we're gonna go in and he's like, Okay and then a minute later he's like, Wait a minute And then immediately comes to find <laughs> you I'll deal with that at that point. A minute later? You just made a worse problem for yourself to, to get advantage on a skill check that you might have passed anyways. <laughs> I think it's, right? Like, I think it's fun. Imagine, imagine casting friends to get advantage, and then you roll like a 17 and a 19 on the skill check that you make. And I'm having a good time. <laughs> you, you actually counterbalance. Like, it, Again, it, I agree with you. I'm going to take it on a character because I, I want to. I want to mess with it. Okay, you say that now, but you're going to instantly regret it. Uh, maybe. Next up, we have Frostbite. Uh, this has a range of 60 feet. It requires a concentration saving throw, and if the creature fails, it does a bit of damage. And if they fail, they have disadvantage on the next weapon attack. Uh, this is not bad, but it's not great. I agree. Um, I think that this is one of those cool cantrips that, like, I'm going to do damage and something else. But again, we've talked, this one requires a saving throw. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of creatures out there with good constitutions. Yeah. Um, a lot of creatures that you want to give disadvantage on attack rolls to that have good constitution scores. I think this is B? It's a B minus. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's not awful. Um, I think that there's certain characters that favor, want control spells in all situations. But I feel like it, you're by the time you're casting Frostbite... You're scraping the bottom of the barrel. It's fun. Uh, I have a character who's playing a wizard who is like a frost mage. So frostbite is one of their spells, but it 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 works and it matches their theme. Yeah. And which which I think is B. Like it's not a bad cantrip to use. They use it and it does what it's supposed to do. Um, but it wouldn't be my go-to. But great on yeah. like a, a a themed character. Next up is Green Flame Blade! Green Fire! Ah, uh, great. Um, this spell, like uh, this spell, like Booming Blade, is one of those attack spells that the rider here is that you're going to attack with your flaming sword that bursts into flame as you attack with it. Um, at higher levels, it's going to deal extra fire damage, and then what's going to happen is the flames are going to bounce to a target beside the other target. So it's a bit of that sort of cleave-type spell effect, which I think is really good. It's really easy to use, but I think it's pretty much exactly under the same conditions as Booming Blade, and it's a little less combo-rific than Booming Blade. Booming Blade has a lot of potential with, uh, with combos that get you to move away or things like that. Green Flame Blade, again, relies on the Acid Splash scenario, where there's yes. a target that is directly next to them which can happen in swarms, but doesn't happen all the time. So I actually find this one 
little more niche than Booming Blade in its applications. Yeah. Uh, I really like it. Like, I, I give this one a B plus. Uh, mm. I think it's good. I think that if you're playing a melee character, like, definitely consider this. I think it's hard to justify taking both Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade. Which, Green Flame Blade which feels like? like it's always the second. It's like it's the kid that gets picked second at gym class compared to the when when you're looking at like the Hex Blades and the Eldritch Knights. Like it's it, the Green Flame Blade. The Blade Singer is second choice. <laughs> you know, there are people who hear that and go, "Well, if you're not first, you're last." And then there's people who hear that and go, second is really, really good." Yep. And both of those could be true. So, Green Flame Blade. Pretty good. Next up, we have Guidance. Are we doing the new Guidance or the old Guidance? So, Guidance has changed in 1 D&D to be a reaction and a not concentration spell. I think Classic Guidance is still S tier and current playtest as of December 2022 Guidance remains S tier. I would have put Guidance as A tier previously, S tier in the 1D&D &D playtest really? packet. Interesting. I, found, I find Guidance hard to use currently. That's a very good point. I find that there are times where like, okay, I'm going to give a scenario here. There's times that like you're at a tavern and they're like arm wrestling contests and I'm like, my friend, you have guidance on your arm wrestling contest. But then there's a lot of times that skill challenges just kind of pop up out of like in the midst of the back and forth between the DM mm. and the players. And it always feels really awkward to be like, oh, 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 can I, can I cast guidance? Yes, and you use it like a reaction. So yeah. the change in 1D&D &D actually reflects the way yes. players actually use it, which makes it better, in my opinion. Yes, that's why, for, yeah. for me, the A tier previously was like, if you're in a situation where the DM's like, oh yeah, what you're trying to do right there, uh, give me an acrobatics check. And the player's like, oh boy, I don't have very good acrobatics. And I'm sitting there with guidance being like, my turn just ended. Mm -hmm. well, I, I could have helped, but we didn't know that this was coming up. Yeah. So that's where it becomes tricky, but... If we're playing with the playtest packet from 1D&D, S tier, absolutely. You know the other really interesting thing about the new guidance that you can't do with the current guidance is you can't stack current guidance with enhance ability because they're both, at least is the same character, because they're both concentration effects. Whereas with current guidance, you can, it's, it's really interesting the, the combos now that are possible with it. Although classic guidance is still amazing. Um, it getting that 1d4 extra on the skill check when you know to prepare for it is great i think you know what i think you're right it is kind of a tier it's great it is great but you're right that it requires that foresight the way players use it as if it was the one D version is s tier because the reaction speed when you need it is is cool um still one of the best cantrips in the game and totally worth taking magic initiate to get it Lastly for this video, we come to Gust. Gust is another one of these controlling the element cantrips. This one is dealing with wind. It allows you to push a medium or smaller creature five feet, push an object that isn't being held or carried 10 feet, or create a little sensory option, um, a little sensory effect hmm. uh, with the wind. I think that this is better than the fire one because battlefield control is great. There are so many concentration spells that you can lay down and then gust people five feet into it. Aforementioned example, you could use gust with create bonfire. Yes. And you've got a cantrip level battlefield control where you're pushing people into your little fire. I was thinking about this in between and I actually realized that you could combine as a druid with the telekinetic feat create bonfire, gust, thorn whip, and telekinetic, and create a situation where you could, in theory, have a lot of different ways to yank someone into that bonfire. I, I do think that, that that is a selling point. As we talk about the combo potential, gust rises above mm -hmm. the, uh, the control flame. Uh, just the ability to push targets even five feet 
if you're standing near a cliff, you can just boop nudge enemies yeah. off of it. There's the the five feet of movement can actually drastically change a combat yeah. encounter. And, and again, to to go on that combo, if you have a creature that's in your bonfire at the start of your turn, you can gust them out of it, telekinetic them back into it. Sure, they have to fail two saves, but you just did that little twiddle, twiddle the fingers to get that extra damage out of it. So it is a possible way of getting more out of a little cantrip combo. But, uh, and again, if you're using it with more powerful battlefield control, like Entangle or Wall of Fire or anything like that, I think you could do a really cool... Druids are like sleeper hit battlefield controller. Yep. They actually have a lot of like cool options between all their spells. I almost want to give Gust an A tier. I love the battlefield control potential of this cantrip. Yeah, I think it's A minus B plus. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. that that's fair. I think that there's just a lot of other options. Yeah. And fundamentally it's short range and the fact that it is only five feet means that it the the primary benefit of Gust is that it's at range. Because you can always shove somebody five feet by running up to them and pushing them, but then you have to make that opposed check. So this has been part one of our cantrip ranking video. Again, we're ranking these based on our experiences. If any of the cantrips that we gave high or low scores to have worked differently in your game, tell us about how you use them and any stories that you have about how they worked in the comments below. The videos that we make on our channel are made possible because we have an amazing Patreon community that helps support our work. A huge thank you from both Kelly and myself to all of our patrons for everything that you do for the channel. If you want to become one of our patrons and join our community, follow the links in the description below. And if you want to see me overusing Firebolt in a campaign, you can check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which is Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we got plenty more videos on all the spells and tier rankings for D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.